one of the stories that I, I think has gotten lost in the scrum is a new report from the IPCC, and it is it is a uh, it's a firecracker. It's uh, it's a stick of dynamite. And I wanted to get on Dr. Michael Mann, the, uh, uh, one of the world's leading climate scientists, the distinguished professor of meteorology, the director of the Earth System Science Center at Penn State University, a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the recipient of the Tyler Prize, the author of numerous books, including The Madhouse Effect, How Climate Change Denial is Threatening Our Planet, Destroying Our Politics, and Driving Us Crazy, and his most recent book, The New Climate War. You can find his website at Michael Mann, with two N's at the end, dot net. And his Twitter handle is Michael E. Mann, M-A-N-N. -N. Uh, Dr. Mann, welcome back to the program. It's so nice to have you with us. Well, tell us about this new IPCC report. Yeah, thanks. It's good to be with you, my friend. Um, so, you know, in a sense, these reports uh, don't come as surprises to scientists like myself who work in this field because they're based on the published science, the published science over the last several years. Um, that having been said, um, these reports are our best opportunity to inform the public and policymakers about what the science has to say. And here, again, there really aren't any surprises because we can see the impacts of climate change now in the form of uh, these devastating heat waves and wildfires and floods and superstorms and droughts that we've been facing. What this report does do, however, is connect the dots for us because since the last major IPCC report back in 2013, there have been some significant developments in the science of what's known as attribution, which is to say we no longer have to say, oh, well, you know, we can never blame any one uh, you know, weather event on climate change, which was sort of like a, a mantra for climate scientists for so many years because we didn't have the tools to connect the dots. Now we have those tools. We can say that many of these extreme uh, weather events, like the heat dome that we saw last summer, like the flooding rains that we faced here in the, uh, in the east in the wake of uh, Hurricane Ida, we can now say that these events would not have been so extreme and so devastating if not for the impact of climate change. And so that really allows the IPCC to say, yeah, devastating climate consequences are here, and now it's a question of how bad we're willing to let it get. And, and how, how, first, I, Excuse me. Two two questions came to mind simultaneously. One is, you know, how is the world reacting to this? I mean, is is is, is it completely being lost in the Ukraine scrum? And 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 secondly, you know, we, we were told a while ago that we've got about a decade left and that sort of thing. Are those timelines for change changing? Well, they're only changing in the sense that we said that a, a couple of years ago. So it's, it's a couple of years later. And, you know, now we have to do even more uh, because that window is shrinking. The report says as much. The window of opportunity to prevent catastrophic, truly catastrophic warming um, is shrinking. And we've got, you know, less than a decade now to bring our carbon emissions down by 50 percent. And then we've got to bring them down to zero within a couple decades if we are or within a, a few decades if we are to uh, prevent one and a half celsius that's roughly three degree fahrenheit warming of the planet where we will and in, indeed start to see uh, far worse impact so there is a shrinking window of opportunity uh, but it's still there we're seeing tornadoes in places that never had tornadoes we're seeing uh, mile long storms, these derechos or whatever they're called, that, that you know, uh, most of us didn't even know the word. Be I certainly had never heard the word before. Uh, it's now part of our lexicon. Um, how, what's your sense, I mean, not, not so much as a scientist, but as, a, as an astute observer of, of uh, humanity and, and the United States, um, and you've written several books and you've, you've been in the, in the center of the political firestorm as much as probably any other climate scientist in the world. Um, what's your sense of the will among both the American people and the American political class? I mean, I see that the, uh, the, the, the Petroleum Institute is uh, uh, pushing really, really hard now because of Ukraine to increase production in the United States of fossil fuels. Uh, none of that would even come online for a year or two or three, you know, if we were to start leasing more offshore lands and things like that. But they're taking this opportunity. Um, how tough a, a lift is it going to be for the United States 
to seriously do something about climate? Well, there's no question, you know, the fossil fuel industry has a lot of politicians on their payroll um, at this point. And we see that even in the Democratic Party, we can't get 50 votes now for meaningful climate legislation with a couple holdouts um, that have prevented the passage of the Build Back Better plan with the, clim the, the critical climate provisions that it contains. And what that means is that we, you know, have to exert even more pressure on our politicians. We've got to turn out in droves, not just in the presidential elections, but in the midterm and off-term elections. Because when we don't do that, then the forces of denial, the forces of inaction, the fossil fuel interests and those who promote their agenda are, are able to elect politicians who will do their bidding rather than what's right for the American people. And so it, it really underscores uh, the, you know, the fundamental importance of, of voting and participating in our democracy. And of course, we're seeing that you know, now play out on the world stage where a petrostate in Russia um, has in part used the, um, you know, the ransom essentially it holds uh, against other nations that, de you know, that, that depend upon its fossil fuel exports, um, is, is used that to, uh, in essence, to try to, um, you know, blunt efforts by other countries to step in with this current conflict. And, you know, the irony is while the fossil fuel disinformation lobby is, putting out this, this, this misinformation, this disinformation um, that, you know, that the, the, the source of the problem somehow is renewable energy and we need to double down on our fossil fuels. The problem here is our dependence on fossil fuels. It's built up bad actor petrostates like Russia and Saudi Arabia that have, ha that have increased power and are able to now uh, participate in, you know, uh, the, the sorts of... Um, you know, in the case of Russia, participate in uh, this aggression uh, against Ukraine because of the power and wealth that it has attained um, built on its one major natural asset, which is fossil fuels. And so, if anything, this latest uh, political crisis underscores the importance of getting off fossil fuels. Right. and moving dramatically towards renewable energy. Especially for Europe at the moment. So what I, I, I know that you're also involved in a lot of these international conferences and, and you collaborate with and have colleagues and friends among scientists in many other nations. Um, uh, you know, uh, you and I both popped up in, in Leo's, uh, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's movie, Ice on Fire, where we were traveling all over the world and talking to these folks. And, and what's your sense of how Europe is doing right now with regard to this and other countries around the world? And I guess China would be the other big one, um, perhaps India, um, in terms of uh, dealing with fossil fuels. Yeah, well, Europe is, is doing better than we are in the United States right now. Germany has been a leader um, in, in moving away from fossil fuels, but they still depend on fossil fuel exports from Russia. And that was sort of uh, part of the delay frankly, in uh, Western Europe, uh, European countries stepping in um, and, you know, uh, and pushing back against this Russian incursion was because of this worry that they would lose their access to the natural gas and oil uh, that Russia provides. And so um, while the EU uh, is doing better than we are when it comes to reducing their carbon emissions and they're on track to you know, reduce their carbon emissions by 50% uh, this decade, which is what we need to do writ large. Um, now, when you look at China, you know, we're talking about the world's largest polluter. Now, keep in mind that the United States is the biggest legacy polluter. We have put more carbon pollution into the atmosphere than any other country, and that puts a huge uh, amount of responsibility on us to lead on this issue. And we are seeing a re-emergence of leadership now under the current administration after having pulled out of the, the Paris Accord under Trump. Uh, but China right now currently is the largest emitter, and that means we need them on board as well. One of the things that we've seen is that when there is engagement on the part of the United States uh, with the world community on the climate crisis, we see China and other uh, nations come to the table. That happened under the Obama administration. China was actually, um, uh, China had actually exceeded their commitments under the bilateral agreement with the U.S. and under Paris. Uh, but then when Donald Trump came in uh, and threatened to pull out of Paris, that took the pressure off of China and India and others. 
Now they're back at the table. Uh, but the United States needs to demonstrate leadership in order to get the level of engagement we need from China and India. And that's going to mean that we have to back up the pledges that this administration has made with policy that can actually allow them to make good on those pledges. And that means legislation. And that means turning out and, and, and voting and getting more Democrats in the Senate and the House so that we don't have to um, you know, worry about one or two uh, conservative Democrats who can block that entire climate agenda from moving forward. Yeah, the whole mansion cinema problem that we that we all suffer from. What's uh, we just have a minute or so left here before we're going to hit a hard break. What is what is your hope for President Biden's State of the Union address tonight? Well, obviously, you know, uh, we're all sort of um, you know captivated right now by what's going on uh, in the Ukraine, and I hope that he makes. You know, he connects the dots here, though. I, I hope that he uses this as an opportunity to explain why it is so dangerous that we remain addicted to fossil fuels. We fight foreign war, uh, wars, dangerous foreign wars. We rely on hostile uh, country petrostates because of our dependence on fossil fuels. If we can get off fossil fuels, if Europe and the rest of the world can get off fossil fuels, then petrostates like Russia are no longer to, uh, able to exert the influence that they're having right now on our, our world politics. Yeah, we're like addicts and, and Saudi Arabia and Russia are our dealers. Is that the metaphor you'd use? That's not a bad analogy at all, Tom. Yeah, and uh, but it is a, a terrible situation. Dr. Michael Mann, distinguished professor of meteorology, the director of the Earth Science Systems Center at Penn State University. His latest book, The New Climate War. Check it out. Michael Mann with two N's dot net. His website, Michael E. Mann with two N's over on Twitter.